Welcome to Milkshake Monday, episode 107. I want to show and debut our Resurrection Baptist Church Reston mask that we will be putting on for everybody that's coming into the facility for the worship services that will start on the second Sunday of September. So here are Resurrection Baptist Church. It says RBC Reston, Jesus protected with a cross on the front. Now, when I was sharing the actual proof with um, my daughter of my rebel without a cause, <laughs> she said, mom, you know, there's all this controversy. And I said, you know, Jesus Christ protects us with the mask. It's not anything that we should be not doing something wise. And if the public health officials have said that COVID-19 is you're protected and you're protecting others by wearing a mask, then it makes sense for us to wear the mask. So that's one thing that, that I wanted to share with you. Also, some of you have seen that our mother of the church, Rosina Pearson, has gone on to be with the Lord uh, today. And part of you is, is sad and, and you're going to miss our mother, our champion of love, as I call her. But also there's a joyful part to know that she's not suffering. She's with the Lord Jesus Christ celebrating around this right? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. She's up there with the 4 and 20 elders and with all of her family and the friends and those loved ones who have gone on before and in heaven. So we have something to be excited for for her. But at the same time, I know we're all sad at this. So tonight we're talking about the topic, which came first, the witness or the egg? And I'm playing off of that expression that we used to say, what came first, the chicken or the egg? In the past weekend, I was a part of a fellowship of brothers and sisters, and we were going through a training session. And we started talking about evangelism and kingdom thinking and kingdom building. And one of the things that was discussed was a conversation between us. And I was making a point that it's important for us to share Jesus Christ, that we have to be careful not putting the social services of the helps in front of the witness. And a couple of the brethren and sisters said, you know, you can't really talk to, uh, talk to them about Jesus Christ or give them a witness or bang them over the head with the Bible. If they're coming to you with a need and they need to eat and they're hungry and they need the lights turned on, they're not going to be receptive and they'll be more receptive if you give them that stuff and help them. And then they'll be more receptive to hear the word of God. Well, you're on these Zoom things and I... I'm not pushy. I can be pushy with my own household and, and other things. But in that case, I wasn't going to be pushy. But it bothered me the whole session because I said, we always need to look to the witness of what the word of God teaches us. What does Jesus demonstrate for us to follow him and deny ourselves? And the way the world is leading us as opposed to Christ leading us has me concerned because as we start to go back to the worship experience that's not on television or the radio or these different mechanisms, I hope and pray in the name of Jesus that we are changed to follow after what he's showing us. So I decided today, thank you, Lord, um, to actually share what does it show in the Bible of how Jesus has approached this issue of the witness. And where I say the joke about the egg is that that could be somebody's light bill. That could be somebody's uh, rent. That could be somebody's groceries. That could be somebody's hotel because they're homeless. That could be anything. It's the need that is what the person who comes to you presents. What the the person that comes to you, to the church or to you individually, they always come with a need. But I think we have to remember the scriptures that says first, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. But it's not talking about the things of the natural world. It's not talking about the things of groceries and light bills and cable bills and can you help me turn this back on? See, that's our thinking. He's talking kingdom things. He's talking eternal things. But we're faced with the natural things. And when people come and cry and they say, my children are hungry, I'm going to be thrown out, all these things are going on. Remember that same scripture in, in Matthew where it says the Lord had the father, the Lord, our God knows what we have need of before we ask. But in our conversation, we have recognized that we have lost two and three generations of people because they found that Jesus Christ and his word and his witness 
are not important for them to live in their natural life day to day, whether they want to go to worship, you don't find that they want to go to worship. They don't want to share their, the message of Christ to their children because it wasn't important to their parents. So therefore it's not important to them. And now we have these circumstances, circumstances that will pull all of our heartstrings, pull circumstances that none of us want to see a baby or children hungry. We wouldn't want to be hungry. We don't want our kids hungry. So therefore we don't want them hungry. We don't want anybody sitting in the dark. We don't want anybody thrown out with the stuff on the street. So you don't get my topic twisted. It's not that we don't want to be a help and share love and share what God, like Reverend Helm says, God is always forgiving and giving. So I don't want you to get it misunderstood of what I'm saying, but we have to be careful not to let the egg of giving things to help people before we give them Jesus. All of the needs that any of us have, we all need Jesus first. Because guess what? After you get the sandwich, you still need Jesus. Before you needed the sandwich, you needed Jesus. And we have a lot of people in prisons who got plenty of food, were in plenty of lighted places, were in plenty of situations of having cars and houses and lands, and they still found themselves in prison, or they found themselves depressed and suicidal, or they found themselves addicted with drugs, alcohol, whatever's going on. So it's not about those things that we offer temporarily. We got to get to the heart of what the people need. And I remember being an unsaved believer. I had a void. I had a house. I had food. I had all the things that you would think a young lady needs, but something was missing. And at this weekend's talk, all of us shared about how something was missing in our life before Christ was presented to us. And we realized that, that what was missing was not a what, it was a who. And so when you're getting ready to see these five scriptures tonight, I want you to see in every situation that it's the Lord that speaks about himself, about his plan, about his purpose. And then I'm telling you the answer before we finish. And then he feeds and then he heals and then he supports and encourages and brings about changes. But the change starts first with the witness of Christ saints. People, t we were in this conversation and people said, oh, once you give them something, that's when they're going to be sensitive to come to church. People come to the church who won't come to hear, hear the word, but they'll hum, come to get the light bills. They'll come to get cable. Christ didn't come with the message of giving those things out. He did, that, that wasn't his purpose. When he said, go, he therefore make disciples. It wasn't making them whole for the light bill, the cable bill, the grocery bill. That's the kind of thing we're doing. And nothing is wrong with missionary work to help people, but not at the expense of the gospel. So we're going to start in Luke chapter nine, because I'm going to go to the scriptures. I'm not going to let y'all say, oh, Sister Helm, you don't know. I don't know. But what I do know is when I have a question like this, Show me in the scripture, the pattern, not a one time off situation. I find the pattern of over and over again. How does Christ handle? How did the disciples handle? How do the prophets handle the situation where people are coming to you, having an earthly need? And did Christ take care of the eternal need first? Or did he take care of the earthly temporary need? Those who are hungry today will be hungry tomorrow. But guess what? If you have Christ in his word, you understand that it's the Lord that's going to give you that daily bread. It's the Lord that's going to help you out of this situation for you to turn to him and fret not because you're looking to him. So in Luke chapter nine, we're going to start at verse 10. Everybody knows some of these scriptures, but we're going to use them in the context of what we're talking about tonight. Chapter two, nine, verse 10 starts out. And the apostles, when they had returned, told him all that they had done. Then he took them and went aside privately into a deserted place belonging to the city called Bethesda. Verse 11. But when the multitudes knew it, they followed him and he received them. People coming to him. Why are they coming? 
He received them. Here's the kicker. And spoke to them about the kingdom of God. What was first? He's witnessing about the kingdom of God. He's witnessing about what the father has as the divine plan regarding the kingdom of God. They followed him. He received them. We are going to get all kinds of people to meet us at place to place, coming to the church, calling the church, talking to you because they know you're sensitive. That's fine. But talk to them about Jesus Christ. They can't just want to come to the church for the helps and not the helper, not the savior. We got to get that right. It's not that we're being unloving, but you have to get the heart of the situation. Can you imagine a doctor who sees a patient bleeding to death and offers them a cracker? You got to take care of what's killing them that will kill them eternally for the rest of their eternity before you give them the cracker of bread. Christ is the bread of life. So here they are. He says here, he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. Then he healed them. He healed those who had a need of healing. The witness was first. Then he went to the need, which was the healing. And then you start to see the disciples say, they tell the Lord, send them away. Because they need to get lodging. They need a place to stay. They need lodging and they need something to eat. But Christ tells them to feed him. And you know the story of the 5,000. But the reality is what I want you to see is he witnessed and spoke about the kingdom of God first before he healed, first before he did any miracles of the five fishes and two loaves. He did that first. And that's what I think we have to understand. Two fishes and five loaves. So now we're going to the next example. That is food. People are going to come for groceries. People are going to come because they're hungry. Witness Jesus first. If they don't want to hear the message of God, the spirit is the one that we have to put first. We have to let the spirit lead us in whatever witness we have in whatever giving and sharing we have. We have to let the witness of Christ come through the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit in us is going to speak to the needs, the spiritual needs before you get to the earthly needs. The next example, Peter and John. Let's go to Acts chapter three. We had food because people are going to ask you for food. Let's go to Acts chapter three. Now, Acts chapter three. I have all my pages marked, but I must have not marked that one. Acts chapter three, verse two. We are going to see how in Acts chapter three, verse two, we start out with, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord. I'm sorry, I did the wrong thing. Chapter three, verse two. It says, now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a certain man, like us, we have people come to us, and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. He's using the alms to meet his daily needs. He's there, people have put him there because he's a beggar. He is there with infirmities of his body. He's disabled and he's got the cup or whatever he's got. And he's asking for money. And guess what? He's come in front of the temple because the church folks, the religious folks are there. And just like people will make their way to the church, make their way for a phone call to call the people they know in the church. He's needing money and he's asking two believers that are approaching. He doesn't know Peter and he doesn't know John, but he's seeing them come. So he's going to make the request. Just like some people may not know you, you're a stranger, but you look churchy. They're going to ask you, oh God, do something for the Lord. And yes, nobody's saying you cannot share giving. Give cheerfully, of course. However, what you first give them is what Peter and John will say. Because some of us don't have money. Who are We don't have spare money, but some do. But look at what you do first. It says here, verse three, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. 
and fixing his eye on him with John, Peter said, look at us. Expecting to receive something from us and everybody coming expects to get something because they're going to guilt you. They're going to make you say, oh, you can't be a Christian if you're not going to help me. How are you going to be a Christian? How are you going to be loving? But see, he looked at them expecting to get something. But what he gets is what we need to give. What Peter and John are about to give this man is what we need to give. He said, then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. What I do have, saints, what you have, saints, what we have, we need to give them, which is he's going to talk about the witness of Jesus Christ. He says, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He had to put the name out first. He had to share what he had, which was the power of God first. And you're like, oh, well, he ended up giving that healing. He didn't get no sermonette. He let him know that's, I don't have no money to give you, but I'll give you Jesus Christ and his power and his ability to, to heal you from what you lack of, what you're struggling with, what you're suffering from. All right, let's go somewhere else. John 4. Again, the, the conversation was, oh, you know, you can't be witnessing. They ain't going to want to hear no witness. They're not going to want to hear no witness. You know what? When they have plenty of food, when they have all their bills paid, when they got all the money and all the things they want, they don't want to hear about Jesus either. So if they, they, they're in lack and they don't want to hear about Jesus, and when they have their needs met, they don't want to hear about Jesus. When exactly are you supposed to put the seed? When are you supposed to share the gospel of the living God to them? Because there's no situation based on what we think where we can tell them about Christ because they don't want to hear it when they got everything going for them. They think they're God. They know better than God. They don't need God. They don't need to get out of their bed and go worship on Sabbath. They don't need to go to prayer. They don't need to have you talk to them about that Jesus stuff. They don't need you to talk to them about reading the scripture when they have what they, they need. But when they don't have what they need, they come into the church. But the church is too afraid to witness Jesus and they want to give them the stuff. But guess what? They fast and furious about getting out of there once they got their bill paid. You don't hear nothing from them until the next time, right? So you got to get this right. What is Christ showing us? This is Peter and John. We don't seen Jesus. Let's go on to John chapter four. Let's look at what Jesus does again. Verse one, therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. Verse five said, so he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. What did she come for? She didn't come to meet Jesus. She didn't come to have a conversation with Jesus. She didn't come to hear a witness from Jesus. She didn't hear to come to hear that he going to talk to her about some issues and needs in her life, which is him. She came for water. She didn't come like some people come to the church and to you as believers in Christ. They don't come asking for what they need. They come for asking what they think they want. They come for what they want to ask you for or what they think they're coming for. But God, through the Holy Spirit, could divert them from what they think they're coming for. And all of a sudden they have an encounter with you, with me, with the house of prayer, with the church, with the pastors. But we got to stop losing the witness because we're afraid of they're going to run off. Well, guess what? The churches are empty. The pews are empty because we've taught them, ask for the stuff first. We got to share the Christ of the church first. Here Christ says here, for his disciples had gone, Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Verse eight, for his disciples had gone away 
into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. I can't read the whole discussion here. Christ engages her. He, he gets asked of her a question. Why are you talking to me? You're a Jew. You're not even supposed to be talking to me. You're a man. You're not even supposed to be talking to me. You know, there's no other people here. There's a, you're not supposed to be talking because it's a man-female relationship thing. And now you don't ask me for water. I've come for my own water. I didn't come for your water. That's how some people can be. Even when you help them, they want to think about themselves. But here you got Christ engaging her. But he's going to take the time in John 4 to talk about the things that the Spirit in him, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit are one. He's engaging on the level of witness, not water. See, he's witnessing. He's talking about the things of God. He's talking about how his father seeks true worshipers and she's not there yet. See, he's talking about what's important first before he talks about water. She'll be thirsty tomorrow. she would come fill that bucket tomorrow. But today he's going to talk about what she needs, which is him to know him. That's why at the end of the story, he, she can run to town and say, come see a man. We don't have people running to say, come see a man. They're going to run and say, hey, you know what? First Baptist, second Baptist, first mom out, first this, second this, all this stuff. Oh, they paid my light bill. How you get your, how you get your car? I thought you didn't have no money. Oh, I went to the church. They paid it for me. Really? What church? They ain't talking Jesus. No, what church? Who helped you? Oh, I guess I'll go to them next time I need some help. Not seeking Christ, not come see a man about my light bill, not come see a man about my rent, not come see a man about my cable, not come see a man because I'm about to be evicted. I'm got to be repossessed. But that's where we've gotten it twisted. We've let the eggs, the seeking of the eggs before the witness of Christ. Let's go on, y'all. Let's go on, y'all. All right, let's go over to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter two. So you've heard you, even though Peter and John heal, let's see another example of this healing because everybody wants something when they're struggling. And when you are struggling in the flesh or your, your flesh is hurting and you're sick and we can go to all these examples about healing. And the one that I'm taking you to now out of Mark chapter two is where the four friends bring the paralyzed man. Jesus was in the midst of being in that house, sharing the gospel. The people were coming for, yes, different ailments, different healings. But first, Christ was proclaiming the gospel in that house. It says in verse 2, verse 1, chapter 2, verse 1. And again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. They may have come to the house for the healing. They may have come to the house in case he's going to do some two fishes and five loaves. But he was preaching the word to them in the house. When we go to the house of God, when we go to our house, when people come with a need, you got to be preaching the word. Let them hear the word. Let them hear the testimony of God. When you don't think it's good enough to share Christ with them, you think it's less to share Christ than to give them a loaf of bread and a drink of water? Is that more important? The water and the bread and the fishes and loaves you think is more important? It's not going to mean so much to them if you start pounding them with Christ. We got to start sharing our testimonies that we were broken, that we were broke. That we were in lack, but the lack was of him. The void in my heart wasn't because I couldn't eat, because I didn't have a house. I had all those things, but something was missing. The void that I felt like I wasn't in, I wasn't at peace was because I didn't have Christ. But here Christ says in verse two, and he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And what he says Is that what great faith you've heard about 
Jesus, but you came to Jesus. But we don't have people coming to Jesus. We have people coming to Sister Donahue, Brother Brooks. I'm making up names. I don't have these people in my life. Pastor Johnson, Pastor, Evangelist this, Missionary this. Can you get the church to give me this? Can you get the church to give me this? Can you give me this? I know you love the Lord. Even the people outside the church know how to pull your heartstrings. They try to pull it so you know you're going to give, which we are loving and we do give. But give them Christ first. Let the Spirit of God woo to you to tell them about who's most important. Who is most important? We're supposed to be fishers of men and the women who come to us in need, but don't look at the natural need. Look at the essential spiritual, eternal need. Let's go to the last one. It's going to be two, but the last example of this five part. First Kings chapter 17. In this case, I want to turn and flip the switch a little bit. Most people that come and ask for help, some of them are in the house of God. Many of them are not. Many of them are not. And in the example of this weekend, we were talking about people who are outside and are don't know the Lord or have backslidden or they just don't know nothing, right? In this case, we have a believer, a prophet and priest of God, who God is going to tell him what he wants him to do. But then when God tells him what he wants to do, God provides the need. God provides the needs because again, remember what it says. The father knows what you have need of before you ask. We have an omniscient God, an all-knowing God, an all-powerful God, an ever-present help in the time of trouble. So even when you are a believer, we still have to reinforce to other believers the power of God, that he knows what you have need of before you even ask it. It's not a surprise to him that you're going to have a struggle with your job, that you're going to have a struggle with your help, that you're going to struggle with this payment, that payment. But what he wants you to do is trust and listen to him. Let's go to Acts chapter 17, verse, uh, we're going to start at verse four. And it will be, okay, let me back it up. I'm going to tell you what's going on. Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall be shall not be dew nor rain these years, except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, God's talking to him. He's a part of God's family. He works for God. Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Sheriff, which flows into the Jordan. Now here's the verse four is the key thing. And it will be that you shall drink from the brook. And I, meaning the Lord, I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. He's told him where the water source is. He's told him that the ravens have been commanded by him to feed him. And he goes on in this teaching to show you that he's being fed by those ravens. And then when that brook dries up, he tells him to go to the widow. And the widow is going to find that she's going to have her provisions through God's hand. We are trying to use our hands, which God does use, but you need to seek him to say, God, what do you want me to do in this situation? And don't think that you're going to hear God say, oh, give him some groceries, but forget about Jesus. Go get your checkbook, but forget about Jesus. Go, go get the debit card and get them what they need. Get them the gas tank filled, get all this stuff for them, but forget about Jesus. Don't be afraid to witness. And the last scripture I want to leave y'all with. We're going to go to Isaiah six. We've all heard this. We've all heard these scriptures, but I I pray in the name of Jesus that when we start to go back to the houses of prayer and houses of worship, that we go with a focus about Jesus Christ being the first because people are dying every day, every day, young, old, in between, not just from the pandemic, just life, because it's an appointed time for all of us. It's a unique time in this 2020. It's an awakening time. But look what this says in verse 8 of Isaiah chapter 6 in the Old Testament. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and whom will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. 
And he said, go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the hearts of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. We talk about, we sing the song, Whom Shall Believe Our Report. We talk about, here am I, send me. But guess what? We have to be sent to share about Jesus. We have to be sent with the words and the wisdom of Christ on our lips. The Holy Spirit has come to give us remembrance so that he can speak through us of Jesus Christ, of the salvation Every person around this globe will have the opportunity to hear about the word of the living God, about his Messiah, Jesus Christ. And we have to give that testimony boldly, without a fear that people would rather walk away because we're not immediately giving them easy groceries and bill paying, but we're sharing sharing the message of Christ. And guess what? If they spit in your face, and say, I don't want to hear that religious talk. Was this Holy Spirit really driving them to come to you to hear about Christ? Or were they just in the flesh wanting to get what they had to get? And they were always going to walk away because they never wanted to hear about the word of God. Now, I want to give you all testimony about something. People always say um, people don't want to receive Christ for many reasons, but a lot of times it's because we don't give our witness about how great Jesus is. And I want to tell y'all something because I've been in some predicaments in my life. Don't get it twisted to think, oh, all is well. It's always been well. That's not true. I had a list because I started getting a list. I said, all the, tr- all the trouble. And I had some troubling days. God will be with my witness. All the trouble that I'm going to list out here. The Lord was with me. The Lord kept me. The, the Lord held me up. The Lord helped me stand when I wanted to crawl and fall. And I don't ever remember saying, I wish I had a a thing of groceries instead of Jesus. Everything I went through, had I not had Jesus holding my hand, holding me up, leading me, teaching me his word. Trials do make perseverance and cause you to get some some grown up spiritual muscles. But look at these things. I've been to courts. And he was there. He was he was there on the stand helping me. I've been in situations where I was enabling crack addicts. Being stolen from. I've had situations of having two daughters in ICU, having a husband in ICU. He was right there. I've been in situations where they said all is lost. You're going to be evicted. You're going to have this repossessed. And he was there to say, honey, it's going to be all right. I was there when I was in fear and doubt and still he came right there and say, honey, remember who I am. Remember, nothing is impossible. I had situations where I didn't know where the next meal was going to come and God showed up. So there are people that are going to come to you. And they're going to look at you in your little suits and your little ties and your little dresses and your little heels. And they're going to say, how do you think? How you know what I'm going through? You say, because I know Jesus. And you can look at this temporary time of your lack and only get temporary things to make it be taken care of for 24 hours and you need something else. But I can tell you about the son of the living God who will be there and you don't have to fret. And you can have a trusting relationship to know that he will never leave you or forsake you. And his seed won't be begging bread because he is the bread of life. He is the love of my life. And I can tell you the best decision I've ever made in my 53 years is accepting that Christ loves me and I had to repent of my sins and ask him to come into my heart and my life as my Savior and my Lord and pray that he knows me. And the the question I ask him I told Reverend, this is the longest question I asked him at 10. Why? What's my purpose, Lord? 
What is my purpose, Lord? Why you got me here? Why do I have the interest in, in medicine and law and love of the talk and all these interests? What? What's it for? Here I am in my 50s hearing that answer. I had to wait. It wasn't that I wasn't asking him. I just, okay, I was like a little kid. I said, I'll hear your answer, but I'm going to keep on doing whatever you need me to do. And now in my 50s, I'm understanding why I needed you to know and understand, Anita, about some things with medicine. Why I needed you to understand some things about communication. Why I needed you to understand some things about studying the Word of God. Why I needed you to understand how you got to be able to talk to people, encourage people. How I needed you to understand how to be faithful when things don't look good. How you got to be prayerful. How you got to trust me in spite of what you see. We got to have a testimony of witness for who Christ is. I love you and I thank God for you. And don't forget, wear your mask. God bless you. I'll see you next Monday.